He was the most famous man on earth during my childhood. Um, not just the most famous man in America, almost certainly the most famous man on earth, perhaps rivaled by the Pope and no one else. And, and when I was a kid growing up in suburban New York, he was a fascinating figure. He, you know, he was not just the heavyweight champion of the world. He was this guy who kind of broke the rules of race in America, broke the rules of religion, spoke out against the, the Vietnam War at a time when nobody else was speaking out about it. So he became this symbol of rebellion, but at the same time, he was so popular. That was so strange. I think it was hard for me as a kid to understand it. But then when I got older and enough time had passed that I could you know, put his story in perspective a little bit and see how he fit into the country's history, um, it occurred to me that it was a, an amazing story and that it had really never been told as a biography. His, you know, He had not yet received the big, um, serious cradle to grave biography that he deserved. And um, I set out to try to write that. Ali was magnetic. Everybody loved him. Uh, he was funny. He was um, smart. And he, he couldn't say no to people. He lit up every room he ever walked in. But he also had you know, a streak of rebellion in him a mile wide. He loved to challenge authority. And that's what I think made him so fascinating. He wanted to be loved and he wanted to be a rebel. And, and that's unusual. Most rebels um, you know, want to change the world. That's their you know, clear um, goal, and they don't care if they make enemies along the way. Ali wanted to have it both ways, and, and that balancing act, that dance, made him, you know, just fascinating to me. Wow, I, I think I was most surprised by the fact that despite his massive ego, he remained really humble in a way. He, he always, you know, he struggled as a, as a kid um, with dyslexia, his father was abusive, and he never, no matter how rich and famous he got, never felt like he was better than anybody else. And that's, that's really extraordinary. And it, it took me a while to figure that out because he was such a gigantic figure, because he was so, you know, sort of full of himself at times and bragging all the time. But um, he loved people and he saw them all as his equals. He didn't see why it would be unusual to spend a lot of time with a stranger who came up to him for an autograph, to invite that person over for dinner. He never got that kind of air about him that a lot of celebrities do. Um, so I think that that humility that remained with him um, was maybe the biggest surprise. I was, you know, there were unpleasant surprises along the way too. I was unpleasantly surprised at, at how he treated women and um, how he treated his wives um, in particular. But I'll try to focus on the the pleasant surprises. He 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 um he made a lot of people happy um, because he was just so open to meeting new people and 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 genuinely interested in their lives. A Baptist, and his mother went to church every Sunday, and he never really took to it. He always wondered why uh, Jesus was depicted as a white man, um, and why um the the church seemed to be geared um toward toward um a white religion he, he viewed it as a white religion and he felt like um if god created everybody equally why were black people treated so differently and then uh, as a teenager he discovered this organization called the nation of islam which was um which had adapted some of the principles of islam um, traditional Orthodox Islam and made it into kind of their own um, ethnocentric um, black supremacist, black separatist, um, some would say cult, others would say religion. And Ali really took to it because it, it addressed a lot of the issues that concerned him as a child. Uh, the Nation of Islam said that black people shouldn't wait for white people to grant them their rights. They should just seize their rights. They should set out to build their own communities, build their own businesses, um, don't rely on the white man and eventually build their own nation. And Ali really took to that. He viewed this, he viewed the prophet, he viewed Elijah Muhammad as a prophet. Uh, Elijah Muhammad was the leader of the nation of Islam and, and Ali believed that he was, um, that he was speaking for God and, and took that very seriously. So um, he changed his name after becoming a member of the nation of Islam. Originally he was going to call himself Cassius X, just as Malcolm Little changed his name to Malcolm X. 
but um, Elijah Muhammad wanted to grant him a special name to show his special place within the organization and decided to call him Muhammad Ali instead of uh, his, of course, he was born Cassius Clay Jr. Ali was drafted. At first, he was declared ineligible for the, for the draft because his IQ tests were so low, um, it mostly, I'm sure, because he had dyslexia. But uh, after the, the rules changed and the cutoff was, was lowered, he became eligible. And at first he just said he didn't want to fight. He didn't think that the war was, was right. He didn't think we should go over to Asia and kill innocent people there. Uh, he didn't see why black people should fight for America when America treated them as second-class citizens. And then he began to talk about it from a religious standpoint. He said that the nation of Islam forbade people from participating in secular wars, that they could only fight in a holy war, um, and that this was not a holy war for the Muslims. So he refused to fight and as a result was convicted of draft evasion and sentenced to, to uh, five years in prison. And um, he appealed that, And but even while he was appealing, he was banned from boxing, um, stripped of his title, had his passport taken away so he couldn't fight outside the country. And for three and a half years, um, lost you know the, probably what, what would have been the best three and a half years of his career. Boxing skills were unusual. It was rare to see a heavyweight fighter who could move as quickly as he did. He had an astonishingly quick jab, which helped him keep uh, fighters away. And he moved like a middleweight or even like a lightweight. He was just so quick. And he had an, an, a great ability to dodge punches. Some of it was just instinctive. He just seemed to know where the punches were going to land and was able, he described it as just being able to move his head the tiniest fraction of an inch um, and he couldn't explain how he did it, but he managed to avoid a lot of damage. So it was this combination of speed and power that made him really unique. Of course, um, when he came back after three and a half years um, outside the ring, when he was exiled from boxing, he was not as fast. And he began to absorb more punishment. He began to get hit a lot more. And we could see how that um, damage was causing him um, brain damage in the long run. But in the short run, um, he was able to get by because he was he um, he turned out to have a great ability to take a punch. Um, he could absorb damage without being um, seriously hurt, without being knocked out. So um, the second half of his career, he really relied more on guile, uh, less on speed, and he proved that he was a great strategist. Uh, unfortunately, the, the were, there was a price to pay for that when it came to the neurological damage that he was doing. First of all, sports are great because they're full of action. There are people who are putting their lives on the line or at least you know, challenging themselves, pushing themselves to the limit of their abilities. But biography in general is a neat way to look at world history. By looking at one person, um, you, know, you, you may, um, you, you're vulnerable to, um, to bias, of course, but, but a, a person's life is, is a great way of looking at history in a way that is more relatable for readers. Um, I'm not a trained historian, I'm a journalist, um, but I think that a great way to understand our history and a way that is more approachable sometimes is to look at one life and to try to look at how history shaped that life and how that life, sh life shaped history. And um, when you do that successfully, I think you find this sweet spot, you know, it's a story that's both really informative as well as, you know, really entertaining. And, and that's, I think that's, that for me is what I'm trying for. one of the most important figures in the 20th century when it comes to civil rights and black rights in America. You can look at um, the, the progress, the evolution in this country. You can look at what people like Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois, du Bois did to raise uh, a consciousness about black rights in the early part of the century and what fighters like Jack Johnson did and then ball, ball players like Jackie Robinson. Sports was a great way of testing a lot of these political theories because people who weren't ready to change laws um, saw that black athletes and black entertainers were changing culture and the laws would catch up. So if Jackie Robinson proved that black people could play baseball with white people, and if Muhammad Ali proved that black people could um, stand up and speak out uh, for themselves in sports, 
then suddenly it became more difficult to defend the laws that were discriminating against against black people. So um, I think Americans um, are more receptive to change when they see these brave figures challenging the status quo. And then um, th then you start to see the pressure building on lawmakers to to um, legitimize, to legalize some of those changes. With Ali and with a lot of other famous men and women, we tend to um, celebrate them to the point that we we ignore their flaws. Um, and I think that's a mistake. We, we turn our heroes into superheroes. We turn them into, you know, these cartoon figures. And I think it's important to remember that that our heroes don't have to be perfect. I really wanted to show that Ali was was brave and brilliant, but he was also flawed. He was he was stupid when it came to managing his money. He treated women very poorly. Um, he turned his back on friends like Malcolm X. Um, I believe he could have possibly saved Malcolm X's life and chose not to. So I wanted to create um, an, an, an accurate, nuanced image of Ali. I wanted to give people a sense that, that he was human um, because if we expect our heroes to be perfect, then nobody's ever going to try to be heroic. Ali is one of the most important figures in American culture for the 20th century. He forces us to confront the atrocities of the Vietnam War. He forces us to confront our own racism. He introduces Islam to many Americans. You know, this is a religion that's almost completely unknown in America into the middle of the 20th century. And um, Ali, when he changes his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali, uh, the reaction among most Americans is, what kind of a name is that? Um, even though it's a, quite a common name in, in, in much of the world. Um, so I think he, um, he changes American culture um, as much as, as anyone I can think of uh, from his era. I believe Ali was the most important sportsman of his time. I think um, certainly in America, um, I'm not sure if there were any other figures worldwide because I'm American and I, and I don't know football very well. Yeah. Um, but well, I, I still think that um, if you look at the whole world, if you look at Africa and Asia and, um, you know, Ali was important everywhere. You know, his his emergence really um, excited people, um, especially in, in um, Arab countries, because they had never had an American speak up for them. And he had never, and he spoke up for, for black people in America. He spoke up for the underdog. He became um, a hero of the anti-war movement. Um, so I think he, he touched on so many different lives and inspired so many different people for so many different reasons, um, even that go far beyond his boxing. So it's hard for me to think of anybody who had, who had that kind of an impact any, in the world. He had a ton of white friends um, and uh, he he loved everybody. He didn't really think about it in terms of color, even though he was a member of the Nation of Islam and and, and he and the white and they referred to the white people as the devil. Um, but Ali did never, never embrace that view personally. His his trainer um, was a white man, Angelo Dundee, his business yeah. manager. He had had a lot of white friends. Howard Cosell, of course, the sportscaster was one of the most important figures in Ali's life. So there was, um, even though he claimed that uh, he was, um, you know, a black separatist and that he didn't, he, he, he said he thought integration was wrong. He would be horrified if his, if his um, children went to school or dated um, white people, but he ended up having, you know, his children did marry white people and, and he lived in neighborhoods that were mostly white. So he, he, he talked about racial separatism, but he did not live that way. The teachings of the Nation of Islam said that um, black people were the better race, that white people were the devil, and that they, they should remain apart. As Ali often said, bluebird, bluebirds go with bluebirds and redbirds go with redbirds, um, you know, and, and that was his that was his philosophy, at least and that's what he preached, but he didn't practice it. Absolutely. I interviewed hundreds of people for this book. I found, you know, some of Ali's old classmates from from his from his elementary school and from his high school. I found the the girl who gave him his first kiss. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I interviewed business managers. I interviewed fighters. I interviewed fighters who, who, who had only sparred with him. I, I had just a great time um, interviewing the people who, who traveled in Ali's orbit. softened Ali in the public image. We've turned him into kind of this teddy bear. We know when he suffered from Parkinson's and he was, could no longer speak, he became this sort of uh, angelic figure and we turned him into a bit of a saint. And I worry sometimes that we've, we've softened him and lost sight of his, his radical nature. Um, so, it, you know, it's gotten to the point where everybody loves Ali. He's on t-shirts, he's on posters, he's on billboards, and he's become kind of a, you know, this almost sainted figure um and and it's it, it troubles me a little bit because i think we need to remember just how controversial he was he was the most unpopular you know man in in, in, in white america uh for a long time and and now we've kind of forgotten that side of him i was interviewing people about ali i was asking them sometimes about the meeting between ali and king they met twice and people who knew both of them um, thought that they that the two men really hit it off, and um, I became curious about King and 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 why he um, you know why he and Ali hit it off, and I began asking more questions, and then I realized that at that point it had been thirty five years since the last King biography had been written, and that was just astonishing to me. So I re I, I I I realized that there were dozens and dozens of people alive who still knew Martin Luther King. And he would he would only be 94 if he were still alive today. So um, it's 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 you know possible if he hadn't been assassinated that he might still be with us. So I decided to begin trying to interview everybody who 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 knew Martin Luther King, and and that became my quest for the last six years. And um, I interviewed dozens and dozens of people um, who who knew him well, um, including some of his closest friends, family members, and. Um, it's and I'm proud to say that um, I I think this is um you know the lat maybe the last biography that you can write with living witnesses who knew Martin Luther King Jr. Normally somewhere between three to five years, um, and and this one for King was six years. There's no getting those years back, so you better choose your subjects well. Uh, I make lunch for my wife so that she can work and make money. <laughs> <laughs>